night, I was, as I mentioned in the email earlier to the families, uh, the fall of 2019 was our last exordium, if you can believe that. We've learned a few things since then. Hopefully, and we'll share some of those with you tonight. Uh, let's, um, let's open with prayer, if you would mind standing with me, and let's pray. Ask the Lord to bless our evening. Father, we are grateful for your kindness, your mercies, your many gifts to us, this school, these students and parents and relatives, uh, the teachers that you brought to us, and the great thing that you have uh, blessed us with. <clears throat> we ask that you would watch over and protect us tonight, bless these students as they present, and that you, all that is said and done would be glorifying and honoring to you. For Christ's sake, amen. amen. Uh, G.K. Chesterton said that uh, education is the passing of a soul, or the soul of a society, passing on to the next generation. Uh, the soul of a society is it passes on from one generation to the next, more accurately. Uh, or another way to say it is an education is uh, the passing on of a civilization to the next generation. Uh, you might have noticed in the recent months and now years, and many, many years really, that the increasing uh, destruction of that society that we're seeing around us. Uh, the traditions have been destroyed, morality is being destroyed, our buildings are being destroyed, our histories are destroyed or rewritten, uh, literature is destroyed or banned or no longer able to read this or that book, our constitution destroyed, economy destroyed, etc. Uh, we're not in a good position as it's falling apart and somebody attacking that which has been handed to us through um, the, the church and its influence on society in the West for a millennia. Uh, a Christian education at Geneva is a project in keeping those best things that God has given to us, building, creating, civilizing. Civilizations are built, they don't just happen, they, uh, they are cultivated. It takes time and work and plowing and planting and irrigating for a civilization to happen. Anyone can tear down the language, destroy the literature, rewrite history, mock and sneer and criticize those who are working hard to try to build. It's easy to think, stand 30 feet behind Noah and make fun of him as he's working for 100 years to, um, to build this ark. And one night they could come and torch it and by the morning it would be uh, all uh, in, in coals. So destruction is easy, building is hard. And how do you build a culture? Well, it has to start with faith in Christ and obedience to his word. It has to begin with uh, looking at his word, studying his word, studying his world, and how he reveals himself in that world, which is what we're doing day to day in all that we're studying at school. And then seeking out wisdom and building on the work of Christ as it becomes revealed to us and by his spirit in us, in his people, in his church, in our homes, um, into the school and into the city, as it, as it grows. So this is, this is the work that the Lord has called us to in Christian education, and we are thankful that he continues to bless us as we bring up our children in the Lord in this way. Uh, we have a sampling of things that we've been doing for the last year, and um, across various um, subjects and disciplines that hopefully, uh, these are all things that pr are preparing them, our students to be leaders, to be servants, to be builders of culture, uh, as you can already hear, and to serve Christ faithfully in his kingdom, to serve their neighbor, and to rebuild civilization for Christ's uh, kingdom and for his sake. So we thank you again for being here tonight, and uh, hope you enjoy the evening, and we'll start off with the pre-K class.
T. Me, Molly, Mr. Mr. I fell out, and what do you think it was all about? She loved coffee, and I loved tea. That was the reason we couldn't agree. All right, in our uh, rhetoric course, one thing we do is um, uh, an exercise in rhetoric. Okay, go ahead and come forward, if you will, uh, and Ivan. Uh, uh, controversiae is a declamation exercise. Uh, you go through numerous exercises, but this gives a student, it's a form of uh, speaking or declamation that gives a student practice to argue a side of a case. Uh, often these were involving uh, treason or poisoning or uh, disinheriting someone or these kinds of things would be made up stories that you'd give to students and to argue through a case and have to reason through it. Uh, so we did one of these um, a few weeks back and I thought this would be a really fun one to listen to. I thought about having them judge each case by applause or hand at the end of the night, but it might be a little too cruel. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> so, so I'm going to read this case uh, and, they're, and uh, Ivan and Jake and are both going to argue uh, sides of this case, but I'll read the setup first, and then uh, they'll take it from there. Uh, the law says that if anyone abandons ship in a storm, his possessions revert to those who stay on board. So a storm comes up, and a certain ship, and all the crew abandon ship and take the lifeboats, except for one man who is too sick to move. The ship and the lifeboats survive and are washed ashore. The sick man claims all the possessions on the ship for himself, but the crew claims that it's theirs, arguing that the law was meant for, uh, to reward brave shipmen, uh, not sick men. So who should get what is the question. Comes the mighty gale, cowards leave brother behind, a very sick man, rich man. There was not enough time. It had come out of the blue. The captain of the Queen's Gambit could not see where the water separated from the sky. The colossal storm had turned the midday sky into a wall of darkness, and it was quickly approaching. The only way the captain and his crew could survive was to abandon ship. 
they all rushed like madmen to the life rafts, begrudgingly leaving their possessions behind, for they were all greedy curs, seeking the riches of the seas. But in their frenzy, the shipmates had neglected a part of their body, a lowly deckhand left in the hold, sick to immobility. This sick Christian sailor prayed that God would preserve his life as well as the lives of the crew, for he was an honorable man. It pleased God to answer his prayers, and the Lord preserved the lives of all those caught in the mighty tempest and cured the honorable sailor of his illness. This man was discovered days later, along with the mostly intact gambit. The moment the crew heard this, they sped to the wreckage to gather their belongings and earthly possessions. But they froze, dead in their tracks, when the rejuvenated man claimed all of the objects on his ship as his. There is a law that states that if any man abandons his ship in a storm, all of his possessions revert to those who stay on board. The shipmates were infuriated that this man had the audacity to claim all of their belongings as his own. They yelled at him, saying that if he could have moved, he gladly would have joined them on the life rafts. They claimed that this law was only meant to reward brave men who stand steadfast on their ship, risking their own lives to attempt to save the ship from the storm. But where in this law does it clarify this? Suppose that this law was intended for that purpose. It's not unreasonable, for there is honor and steadfastness, and disgrace and cowardice. But, theoretically, if the legislators made this law for that purpose, they obviously neglected to mention it, because there are no exceptions or clarifications mentioned. Legislators are supposed to be smart and think through loopholes in the laws they make. So, if it was intended for that use, the man who stayed should receive all of the possessions because it is the legislator's fault for making the law ambiguous. And if, theoretically intending for this law to apply only to men attempting to save the ship, they should then go back and clarify this fact because it, because it is unclear in that area. And even if they do change it, they should still let the man keep all of the crew's possessions because according to the current rules of the law, which clearly state if any man abandons his ship in a storm, all of his possessions revert to those who stay on board. This man passes every requirement the law mentions. Did people abandon ship? Yes. Was it because of a storm? Yes. Was there someone who stayed on board? Yes. Therefore, he who stayed on board of his ship has the right to all of the possessions on it. In this way, the Christian man persuaded his crew that all of the possessions belonged to him but the unsatisfied crewmates tried to gain their possessions back another way. They confronted him, saying that if he called himself a Christian, he would give back their things, because Christians are called to be charitable and gracious. Oh, the hypocrisy! He had been left for dead. If the crew had been thinking about anything but themselves, they could have easily carried the sick man to the raft, but instead they left him to die. But he though he was left to die alone, prayed not only for himself, but also for the crew that left him to die alone in the middle of the ocean. And God rewarded his faith by letting every man live. So no, this man did not give anything to the craven crew, but instead charged them to start a new and honest life, one full of the charity and grace that they pretended to know so much about. Saying this, he left with his newly acquired possessions and the lowly deckhand went home to his mother and father a very rich man. Thank you. The life of a sailor is hard. You have to deal with the weather, the heat, and the sickness, but even sometimes the crew. You'll endure constant fights, suffer hard work, and sometimes your crewmates will steal your possessions. There once was a ship that was entering a storm, and all crewmates abandoned ship, except for one very sick man who was too weak to get to a lifeboat. Fortunately, everyone got to the shore safely. However, when the other sailors tried to reclaim their items, the sick man would not let him, pronouncing that he gets to keep all the crewmates' stuff. In this situation, I support the position that the crewmates are being stolen from and should get their belongings back. In my research, I discovered this, that this law stating if anyone abandons ship in a storm, his possession reverts to the, those who stay on board was an ancient Roman law put in place to encourage heroism. They made this law to reward the hero who stayed on ship. 
The sick man does not deserve the crewmate's possessions because he did not save the boat or even ch choose to remain on board. G.K. Chesterton said, Virtue is not the absence of vice. Virtue is an active thing. This law was made, rewarded, this law ma was made to reward the act of virtue and not the not practicing of a vice. The virtue of saving this ship and not not abandoning it. No one was the hero in this case. The, the possession should go to the original owners. If the possessions were to go anywhere besides back to the crewmate's possession, it should go to God, because he was the hero. He saved the ship. Secondly, laws are made for the good of men. In the second chapter of Mark, Jesus says, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. He says this when the Pharisees accuse him of breaking the fourth commandment. Jesus teaches us that even holy and perfect law is meant as a blessing to, for us and can be adapted to the situation. Jesus reminds us in this passage, passage that even David, a man after God's own heart, ate the showbread and gave it to those who were with him. That was not lawful, technically lawful. Jesus, so, Jesus shows us here that the laws were made for the man and not man for the laws. I acknowledge that, that it was not right for the crewmates to leave the sick man behind, we are, but we are discussing the rightful ownerships of the crewmates' properties and not whether or not a scared group of people fighting for their lives acted blamelessly in the moment of crisis. If he were able, the sick man would have done the exact same thing. In conclusion, the sick man is being selfish. Stealing the rest of the crewmates' private property, he is not loving his neighbor as himself, but rather acting bitter over hard trials, a sickness, and a storm that God ordained. Never use the law to take advantage of others, but seek to bless them by obedience to God Almighty. Thank you.
God's Word today? The Bible is God's Word. How many gods are there? There is one true God. How many persons are in the Godhead? Three. Who are these persons? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Where is God? He is everywhere. Can you see God? Can no, I, I cannot see God. God. A uh, second controversy I'll uh, introduce uh, to you. Ava and Samson will uh, uh, debate this one. Uh, it goes like this. Anyone who kidnaps another and either sells him or still has him when he is caught must be put to death. Exodus 21, 16. A man divorces his wife and the woman gets custody of their son. But when she uh, remarries, the new husband begins to beat the boy. When the boy's natural father hears of this, he secretly steals the boy away, but puts him to work like a slave. Later, the man is caught with the boy. What should the penalty be that he receives? Exodus 21.16 says, Anyone who kidnaps another and either sells him or still has him when he is caught must be put to death. This is a law prohibiting the kidnapping and selling of others. Tonight, we decide whether or not this man, Josh, has broken this law. I will argue that Josh is innocent and that the charges brought against him cannot be true. Josh was married to Lindsay and they had a son, named Charlie, but later they were divorced and Lindsay got full custody of Charlie. She married another man named Chris, but he beat and abused Charlie. Hearing this, Josh secretly stole the boy away. But when they were found by the authorities, it was discovered that Josh had been putting Charlie to work like a slave. The question before us is this, what punishment should Josh receive? In order for Josh to receive the death penalty, it must be shown that he kidnapped Charlie, for the law in Exodus is a prohibition against kidnapping. Kidnapping is a form of stealing. It is the stealing of persons. Stealing is defined as taking without right or permission. So, if Josh didn't have the right to take Charlie, he is guilty of kidnapping and deserves the death penalty. What rights does Josh have? First of all, as a Christian, Josh is duty-bound to protect the innocent, especially children. That alone is enough to justify his act. But second, he is also Charlie's father, making him more responsible for his safety and well-being. Josh has the rights. But what about the slavery? It has been confirmed that Josh put his son to work like a slave, abusing him, much like Chris was doing. However, if Josh's intent was only to save his child from danger, then the slavery is separate and deserves a separate punishment. If it can be shown that Josh kidnapped Charlie for the purpose of slavery, then he has committed kidnapping and must be put to death. For in doing so, he makes his rights null and void. Unfortunately, there's simply not enough evidence to get a clear answer. Some may say that Josh couldn't take Charlie away because he didn't have custody. His ex-wife, Lindsay, did. But Josh, regardless of who has custody, is still obligated to save the life of his son. What could he do? Just wait it out and see if everything turns out okay? Charlie must be taken out of danger in order that no further abuse happens while Chris is investigated. For instance, you wouldn't let a drug addict take drugs while you, help, while you try to help him out of his addiction. You have to remove his ability to take them you have to stop the sin before you can deal with it. In closing, God for forbids kidnapping, for sure. But we also know that God is a deliverer. 
Out of Egypt, he delivered his people. Out of the hands of evildoers, God saves the righteous. God is our savior. If Josh has saved his child from wickedness and not for the intent of enslaving him, then he is innocent. Thank you. Whoever steals a man and sells him, and anyone found in possession of him, shall be put to death. This is a law stated in Exodus 21.16, and was strictly followed in the time of old Israel. We are here to discuss and answer the following question. Is Josh, the divorced husband, guilty of breaking this law, and should he receive the death penalty? I will answer this question put before us with a simple yes. Josh has broken the law, and he must pay the consequences that goes along with it. This case reminds me of a rose, both delicate and thorny. I say this because when we first hear the details of this case, it is normal to immediately think that Josh is a savior, a beautiful hero rescuing his child Charlie from an abusive household. When we take a closer look, however, we see how wrong this assumption is. Before we begin, it is important for us to remember that Josh has no custody over Charlie. He has lost all parental rights to Charlie, making it illegal for him to take his son, whether, it is, whether or not his intent was good. First, we need to understand that Josh took his child from abuse and put him right back into it. Although a different form of abuse, child slavery is still abuse. Child slavery is the enforced exploitation of a child for someone else's gain meaning the child will have no way to leave the situation or, per, or person exploiting them. Josh is not improving the situation, but changing where the problem is. Deuteronomy 24-7 says, If a man is found stealing one of the people of Israel, and if he treats him like a slave or sells him, then that thief shall die. If he cared about his son, he would bring Chris, the abusive stepfather, to trial for his wrongdoing instead of stealing him and putting him to work. My next point is this simple statement. God's law is the law. Exceptions are not made. He does not allow the wicked to go unpunished. We see a few examples of this in different books of the Bible. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, Uzzah touched the Ark of the Covenant. Uzzah disregarded God's law, and he was put to death. God had previously told the people not to touch the Ark, and Uzzah disobeyed, even though he touched it because it wouldn't fall. Colossians 3.25 says, For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. The punishment seems unfair, but the consequences were known by Uzzah, much like with Josh. Josh and the people of Israel knew all of God's laws and the consequences that went along with them. He should receive the death penalty because it is the assigned punishment for his crimes he has committed against his son. Thank you. Way. 
and she's never dreamt before an S. J B J is only used after a single vowel and says A A A A A. To work is only used after a single vowel and says A A A A A. Z never ends says at the beginning of a base word. You die before E except after C. If we say A and then some exceptions, we were either weird, foreign, sovereign, forfeited, leisure, fever, hyperseas, counterfeit, protein, or caffeine. Does God rule over his creation? Yes, God when God he comes to pass and governs all things by his wisdom and power. Even wicked actions of men shaken are under his rule. This is called his province. Does God is sovereign? I know nothing can happen to me and body or soul apart from his fatherly care. He works all things together for my good and his glory. He is able to do this because he is almighty God. He desires to do this because he is a faithful father. How does God... How does this knowledge of providence help you? This too should make me faithful in prosperity, patient in adversity, can make you a confidence about the future. How did God create man? God made man, male and female, in his image. God made Adam from the dust of the earth and formed a woman from Adam's side. What does it mean that we are made in God's image? It means we are made to reflect God's knowledge, righteousness, and holiness and rule over his creation. What did God command Adam and his wife to do? God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. What did God require of Adam? Adam was to trust God and not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He obeyed by faith. He would have been made a glorified king. Did Adam trust God? No. Adam stood by and watched as the devil tempted and deceived his wife. After she ate the forbidden fruit, he gave some to her husband and he ate. Who is the devil? The devil is Satan, the tempter and accuser of God's people. Satan was created as one of God's greatest angels, but fell away from God. He is now God's enemy and therefore our enemy. But God promised to crush him under the feet of Jesus and his people. So when we resist him, he must flee from us. Genesis, Exodus, Repentance, and Numbers. Do, 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 do on me. Joshua, Judges, we've done none of 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, and Ezra wrote these things. Me, my Esther, Job, Psalms and Proverbs, Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations and Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jeremiah, Ganeu, Habakkuk and Zephaniah, Hey God, Zachariah, and Malachi is the end.
Annunciation by Sembro Botticelli. Would you like a Botticelli? The Sixteen Madonna, a bell of fear. Not the Ninja Turtle. Not the Ninja Turtle.
the Persian Wars taunting Pericles, and the Peloponnesian War. Fifteen Greek philosophers, sixteen Nehemiah, then the Jews returned to Jerusalem. Seventeen came Alexander the Great, eighteen the architecture of Rome, nineteen the rise of the Roman Empire, Greece had diminished while Rome increased. Then came the reign of Julius Caesar, twenty from Caesar Augustus, twenty to the birth of Jesus Christ in the year 3 B.C. Proverbe du sanc set. Alors tu comprendras la crainte de l'éternel. Et tu trouveras la connaissance de Dieu. Car l'éternel donne la sagesse. Du sa bouche sort la connaissance et l'intelligence. Il tient en réserve le salut pour les endroits. Un bouclier pour ceux qui marchent dans l'intégrité. Proverbe 11, 5. Que le sage écoute et il remontera sans savoir. Et celui qui est intelligent acquérera de la vérité. a major gray bear. Herdsman, man with the pipe. Virgin, Virgo. Hercules, man with the club. Pegasus, winged horse. Whale, sea tooth. Thirteen. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable. 
child. But when I became a man, I gave up my childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. First Corinthians 13. That's better. <clears throat> there we go. All right. For our omnibus class, we learned ritual procedures from the book of Leviticus in connection to discussion of books we were reading at the time. The chant is behind me on the screen. Should be in a second. We'll demonstrate how we first learned it. Lay the hands, slay the beast, Spread the blood, burn the flesh, eat the meal. We would like to invite you to participate in this chant with us. But first, let me show you the hand signs. First, we lay the hands. Then we slay the beast. We spread the blood, burn the flesh, and eat the meal. All right, now all together with the hand signs. Lay the hands. Slay the beast, spread the blood, burn the flesh, eat the meal. Now, let's add to it. Let's do it again, this time with stomping. Audience, if you can, please stand, because it will really enhance the effect. <laughs> Ready? Lay the hands, slay the beast, spread the blood, burn the flesh, Eat the meal. Now stay standing, because there's more. <laughs> After learning the chant in class, some of us decided to put the chant to the tune of Jingle Bells. <laughs> oh, lay the hands, slay the beast, spread the blood, burn the flesh, eat the meal, sacrifice is done. Hey! <laughs> that was fun. Let's do it again. But this time, let's do it with stomping. Oh, lay the hands, lay the beast, spread the blood, burn the flesh, eat the meal, your sacrifice is done. Hey! You know, y'all are kind of slow. <laughs> How about we do the same thing but speed it up? Oh, lay the hands, lay the beast, spread the blood, burn the flesh, eat the meal, your sacrifice is done. Hey! Hmm, that wasn't fast enough. Let's give it another try. <laughs> oh, lay the hands, lay the beast, spread the blood, burn the flesh, eat the meal, your sacrifice is done. Hey! That was better. But now I want it at supersonic speed. Ready? <laughs> oh, lay the hands, lay the beast, spread the blood, burn the flesh, eat the meal, your sacrifice is done. Hey!
Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And, and do lean not, not on your own understanding. understanding. The wise will inherit honor, but, but fools get disgrace. Whoever walks with in integrity walks securely. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge. Whoever guards his mouth preserves his life. Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise. In toil there is profit, but talk tends to poverty. A gentle tongue is a tree of life. A glad heart makes a cheerful face. A friend loves at all times. Bad company ruins good morals. What are the 11 most important words? Yes, yes sir, no sir, yes ma'am, no ma'am, please, thank you. John 3, 16 through 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. John 3, 16 through 17. Scotland's burning, Scotland's burning, look out, look out, fire, 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 pour on water, pour on water, so, so, do, do, so, so, do, do, so, so, do, do, so, so, do, do, have our speech meet winners come up and present to you. Uh, I do want to add a, a late addition, and that's Tyler Seacosh is going to do a speech from Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. So if Tyler will come on up, do that. While we're waiting on Tyler, uh, those upper schoolers, they would have done that chant all night if we would have let them. <laughs> and you'll never guess what book they were reading when they were discussing the Levitical sacrifices. It was Moby Dick. So ponder that for a little bit. Friends, Romans, Countrymen, by William Shakespeare, from Julius Caesar, spoken by Mark Anthony. Friends, Romans, Countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is off interred with their bones. So let it be with Caesar. The noble Brutus hath told you that Caesar was ambitious. If it were so, it was a grievous fault, and grievously hath Caesar answered it. Here, under leave of Brutus and the rest, for Brutus is an honorable man, so are they all, all honorable men. Come I to speak in Caesar's funeral. He was my friend, faithful and just to me, Yet Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. He brought many captives home to Rome, whose ransom did the general coffers fill. In this did Caesar seem ambitious? When the poor hath cried, Caesar hath wept. Ambition should be made of sterner stuff. Yet Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man.
here under I come to speak what I do know, but not to disprove what Brutus spoke. You all did love him once, not without cause. What then withholds you to mourn for him? Bear with me now. My heart is there in the coffin with Caesar. I must pause till it come back to me. Friends, Romans Countrymen by Julius Caesar. Spoken by Mark Anthony. I wandered lonely as a cloud by William Wordsworth. I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high o'er vales and hills, when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils. Beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze, continuous as the stars that shine and twinkle on the Milky Way, they stretched in never-ending line along the margin of a bay. Ten thousand saw I at a glance, tossing their heads in sprightly dance. The waves beside them danced, but they outdid the sparkling waves in glee. A poet could not but be gay in such a jocund company. I gazed and gazed, but little thought what wealth the show to me had brought. For oft when on my couch I lie, in vacant or in pensive mood, they flashed upon that inward eye, which is the bliss of solitude. And then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils. I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud by William Wordsworth. An excerpt on Anne Green Gables by L. M. Montgomery. What's your name? The child hesitated for a moment. Would you please call me Cordelia? Call you Cordelia? Is that your name? No, it's not exactly my name, but I'd love to be called Cordelia. It's such a perfectly elegant name. I don't know what on earth you mean. If Cordelia isn't your name, what is? Anne Shirley, reluctantly faltered forth the owner of that name. But please do call me Cordelia. It can't matter much what you call me if I'm only going to be here a little while, can it? And Anne is such an unromantic name. Unromantic fiddlesticks, replied the unsympathetic Marilla. Anne is a real good, plain, sensible name. You've no need to be ashamed of it. Oh, I'm not ashamed of it, explained Anne. Only, I like Cordelia better, at least of late years. When I was young, I used to imagine it was Geraldine. But I like Cordelia better now. But if you do call me Anne, please call me Anne spelled with an E. What difference does it make how it's spelled? asked Marilla with another rusty smile as she picked up a teapot. Oh, it makes such a difference. Whenever you hear a name pronounced, can't you always imagine it in your mind, just as if it was printed out? I can. An A-N-N -N looks dreadful, but A-N-N-E looks so much more distinguished. If you only call me Anne spelled with an E, I would try to reconcile myself to not being called Cordelia. An excerpt from Anne Green Gables by L. M. Montgomery.
Trojan and Ark was saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness that comes by faith. By faith Abraham obeyed because he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. And he was now looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Hebrews 11. Contemporary the Navigator, 1394. Columbus sails to the New World, 1492. Magellan sails around the world, 1522. Spanish Conquest, 1500s. Explorers of the Northeast, 1500s. Rowley sails Roanoke, 1585. Jamestown is founded in Virginia. 1607, Mayflower lands at Plymouth, 1620, Pilgrims build Plymouth Colony, 1621, Massachusetts Bay Colony, home of the Puritans, Roger Williams, founder of Rhode Island, Salem Witch Trials, 1692, 13 colonies formed, 1607 to 1733, First Great Awakening, 1740, Colonial trading with England, 1750. French and Indian War, 1754 to 1763. Parliament acts unjustly, 1764 to 1774. Sons of Liberty, 1765. First Continental Congress seeks peace, 1774. War of Independence begins. 1775. Gonna make this taller. An Exit from Dracula by Bram Stoker. Jonathan Harker's Journal, May 8th. I began to fear, as I wrote in this book, that I was getting too diffuse. But now, I'm glad that I went into detail from the first. For there is something so strange about this place, and in it, that I cannot but feel uneasy. I wish I were safe out of it, or that I had never come. It may be that this strange night's existence is telling on me, but would that that were all. It may be that this strange night existence was telling on me, but would that that were all. If there were anyone to talk to, I could bear it, but there is no one. I have only the Count to speak with, and he. I fear I am myself the only living soul within the place. Let me be prosaic, so far as facts can be. It will help me to bear up, and imagination must not run riot with me. If it does, I am lost. Let me say at once how I stand, or seem to. Let me say at once how I stand, or seem to. I'd only slept a few hours when I went to bed, and feeling that I could not sleep any more, got up. I'd hung my shaving glass by the window, and was just beginning to shave. Suddenly, I felt a hand on my shoulder, and the Count's voice saying to me, Good morning. I started, for it amazed me that I had not seen him, since the reflection of the glass covered the whole room behind me. In starting, I had cut to myself slightly, but did not notice it at the moment. Having answered the Count's salutation, I turned to the glass again to see how I had been mistaken. This time, there could be no error, for the man was close to me, and I could see him over my shoulder. 
but there was no reflection of him in the mirror. The whole room behind me was displayed, but there was not a sign of a man in it except myself. This was startling, and, coming on the top of so many strange things, was beginning to increase that vague feeling of uneasiness which I always had when the count is near. But at the instant, I realized that the cut had bled a little, and the blood was trickling over my chin. I laid down the razor, turning as I did so half round to look for a piece of sticking plaster. When the count saw my face, his eyes blazed with the sort of demoniac fury, and he suddenly made a grab at my throat. I drew away, and his hand touched the string of beads which, which held the crucifix. It made an instant change in him, for the fury passed away so quickly that I could hardly believe that it was ever there. Take care, he said. Take care how you cut yourself. It is more dangerous than you think in this country. Then, seizing the shaving glass, he went on. And this is the wretched thing that has done the mischief. It is a foul bauble of man's vanity. Away with it! Then, opening the heavy window with one wrench of his terrible hand, he flung out the glass, which was shattered into a thousand pieces on the stones of the courtyard far below. Then he withdrew without a word. It is very annoying, for I do not see how I am to shave, unless by my watch case, or the bottom of the shaving pot, which is fortunately of metal. When I went into the dining room for breakfast, I, uh, when I went into the dining room for breakfast, uh, I could not find the Count anywhere, so I dined alone. It is strange that as yet I have neither seen him eat or drink. He must be a very peculiar man. After breakfast, I did a little exploring in the castle. I went out on the stairs and found a room looking towards the south. The view was magnificent, and from where I stood, there was every opportunity of seeing it. The castle is on the very edge of a terrible precipice. A stone falling from the window would fall a thousand feet without touching anything. As far as the eye can reach, there's a sea of green treetops, with occasionally a deep rift where there's a chasm. Here and there are silver threads where the rivers wind in deep gorges through the forests but I am not in heart to describe beauty. For when I had seen the view, I explored further. Doors, doors, doors everywhere, and all locked and bolted. In no place, save the windows of the castle walls, is there an available exit. The castle is a veritable prison, and I am a prisoner. An excerpt from Dracula by Bram Stoker. An excerpt from A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. A wild-looking woman, whom, even in his agitation, Mr. Lorry observed to be all of a red color, and to have red hair, and to be dressed in some extraordinary tight-fitting fashion, and to have on her head a most wonderful bonnet like a grenadier wooden measure, and a good measure, too, or a great Stilton cheese, came running into the room in advance of the inservants, and soon settled the question of his detachment from the poor young lady by laying a brawny hand upon his chest and sending him flying back against the nearest wall. I really think this must be a man, was Mr. Lorry's breathless reflection, simultaneously with his coming against the wall. Why, look at you all, bawled this figure, addressing the inn servants. Why don't you go and fetch things instead of standing there staring at me? I'm not so much to look at, am I? Why don't you go and fetch things? I'll have you know. If you don't bring smelling salts, cold water, and vinegar quick, I will. There was an immediate dispersal for these restoratives, and she softly laid her patient on the sofa and tended her with great skill and gentleness, calling her my precious and my bird, and softly laying her hair over her shoulders with great pride and care. And you, in brown, she said, indignantly turning to Mr. Lorry, couldn't you tell her what you had to without frightening her to death? Look at her with her pretty pale face and her cold hands. Do you call that being a banker? Mr. Lorry was so disconcerted by a question so hard to answer that he could only look on with, at a distance with much feebler sympathy and humility while the strong woman, having already banished the inservants under the mysterious punishment of letting them know something not mentioned if they stayed there staring, recovered her charge by a regular series of gradations and coaxed her to lay her drooping head upon her shoulder. I hope she will do well now, said Mr. Lorry. 
No thanks to you in brown if she does. My darling pretty. I hope, said Mr. Lorry, after another pause of feeble sympathy and humility, that you accompany Miss Manette to France. A likely thing, too, replied the strong woman. If it was ever intended for me to go across salt water, do you suppose Providence would have cast my lot in an island? This being another question hard to answer, Mr. Jarvis Lorry withdrew to consider it. An excerpt from A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. While the upper school's getting set up for our final uh, performance, they're going to sing for us. I uh, just want to again thank you for coming. Uh, it means a lot to the students uh, to be able to show some of the things that they've learned and really lets them enjoy the fruit of their labor. And uh, I hope you've gotten a taste of that tonight. Uh, once they are finished with their song, uh, you are dismissed. Thanks.